Thank you, Leslie. All right. Today, we are going to finish this discussion that we started two lectures ago about the Homeric myths and then the relationship between the Homeric myths and the emergence of Greek tragedy, that, that moment that Nietzsche is going to valorize in the book. This is the book is titled The Birth of Tragedy, right? But we can't talk about the birth of tragedy and we can't talk about it and we can't understand why Nietzsche valorizes it if we don't understand something about the Homeric myths and, and Nietzsche's view of them. And, and not just view of them, but, but what they signify both historically and conceptually in the deeper sense of this class, right? And, and, and I, I, I forgive me if I'm boring you with this, but this is really important. And if you get it, you, you're gonna master the class. Okay, and so where we have been so far, right, is that for Nietzsche, really, Western civilization really begins with the Homeric myths. For him, the emergence of Socrates and the emergence of Plato and the emergence of metaphysics, first metaphysical philosophy and then New Testament Christianity and, 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 and metaphysical theology and then the Enlightenment. Right. For Nietzsche, that moment, the emergence of Socrates and Plato represents a kind of weakness. It, 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 it represents a kind of well, weakness, it, literally a weakness, a, a, kind of, a, a kind of loss of the heroic perspective, a loss of the tragic perspective, a, a kind of decline. Right. Um, and, and so for, for Nietzsche, really Western civilization begins both, both materially Right, in, in the sense that the Iliad and the Odyssey were the first two actual written and rewritten poems that open up Western, his, Western culture, open up first the Greek world and open up how the Greek world gave rise to Western culture. So for Nietzsche, the real origin is that moment and, and, and even just in a superficial academic way, the Iliad and the Odyssey are monumental because they are the first two written epic poems, and not just written, but rewritten. And because they're the first written and rewritten, they, they, they open up. I use this kind of playful language, but I, I like it. And it's important that the visualness of it is important They open up, right? They open up what becomes the Greek world prior to the Iliad and the Odyssey and prior to the way the core ideas and values, the meanings, definitions and values and purposes that emerged from the Iliad and the Odyssey, before that there was no Greek world, right? And from that emerges slowly over time, of course, and with much conflict and, re and restylization, more on that later, emerges what we call the Greek world, right? And, and this, is prof this is really important for Nietzsche. This is the origin. Right? Even if you want to think about it just in a superficial academic sense, yeah, this is why they're monumental, right? Before the Ill and the Odyssey, there is no technically Greek world conceptually, geographically, it doesn't exist, right? And so, so for Nietzsche, he's fascinated by that and that this is the real origin. And, and what, what are the kind of ideas and meanings and values that emerge out of this world that will later become stylized in Greek tragedy? All right, so we talked about that, right? Now, now the really, the equally important part, and for me, I'm obsessed with that, I'm fascinated by this, right? And, and, and it becomes a core element in the understanding of postmodernism in general. Right. In addition to Nietzsche's sort of, hey, let's let, let's go back to the old, to to where we think Western civilization, the Greek world, and hence Western civilization opened. Okay, these two poems, Ill and the Odyssey, and and this is kind of what they did. In in, in addition to that, as a historical and academic kind of material thing, right? The the equally important element. Of this and it's really clear this is what i was saying earlier you get your head around this you're really gonna kind of master the class the 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 important thing to know about that is even though we talk about homer as a name of a person or maybe a couple people or a tribe or and we talk about a homeric 
period, maybe 750 BC between 650 BC. Even though we talk in, in this way, like we're talking about things we know and that things that, that we, we understand and that are true. The, the truth is, to put it in air quotes, the truth is, right, that, that we have no knowledge, zero knowledge of whether Homer was a real person. We have no idea what the truth date about the Homeric period is. We don't know who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. We don't even know if it was one person or two persons or a group of people. We have no idea about the time in which they kind of appeared. We don't, right? And, and, and there are several things to take away from this that I just wanna keep hammering at, at the risk of boring you. I'm sure you guys just wanna, I have enough time to shut up, move on. But this is really important, right? Nietzsche wants you to take something away from this. Foucault wants you to take something away from this. Right? And what Nietzsche and Foucault ultimately want you to take away from this are kind of three things that are kind of happening simultaneously. Okay? One, one, at its most basic, the Greek world and hence Western civilization is opened and invented and created as an artistic phenomenon. It, 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 the Greek world and Western civilization is invented or created. Sometimes I say open, like, like literally, like, like I feel so weird, like a space, a time space of meaning, definition, value, and purpose is kind of opened up, right? And, 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 and I do my modern dance interpretation and I make an ass out of myself to kind of convey this idea that, that it was opened up, it was invented and created and opened Opened up. The postmoderns love to use the word disclosed. It was disclosed, right? And, and we talk about invented, created, opened up, and disclosed because that is happening in a world that in and of itself does not possess meaning, definition, value, or purpose, right? So, so the origin of the Greek world as a kind of artistic, as, as an ascetic, right? Here, let me write it aesthetic experience, right? Right, it's an aesthetic experience, right? It's, it's created, it's invented. Created and invented where? In these two poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, by, written by someone we don't know. During a time we can't, we can't locate, we can't fix, but here it is, here it is, it's open, it's created. And it's, and it's an artistic, it's an aesthetic thing because it's a human invention. It's literally a poem. The origin of the Greek world and, the or, and therefore the origin of Western civilization. And therefore, on this long iteration that, we, that the poem has been rewritten and rewritten and rewritten for how many years now? 2,500, 2,700 years. We're still writing the poem in one way or another. We're rewriting it. We're restylizing it, right? More on that later. But it starts with these epic poems that were written. And those poems were art. They were artificial because they were human inventions. And, and, and as human inventions, words and definitions and values and purposes that are, that are kind of imposed and, and attributed to a geographical space and people, they're also a kind of assertion of power, right? That, that the Greek world was a human invention and a kind of an assertion of power. In this kind of strange way, whoever this Homer person was or these group of people living during this time we can't fix or locate, kind of said, hey, this is, this is what it means to be a hero. This is what it means to be masculine. This is what it means to be feminine. These are the things you fight for. These are the things you don't fight for. Oh, in, in that part where Achilles fucking leaves, leaves Troy, he's a coward. That's what it means to be a coward. Okay. 
right? So it, the, these, these words with these meanings and these values organized in these purposes, that, that is a human invention and it's an assertion of power, right? And that's critical, right? Now, now the second thing that it illuminates for us that is Nietzsche's really obsessed with and Foucault's obsessed with is that we don't, because we don't know anything about who Homer was, if again, zero, the word Homer is a fiction. It's a fiction, even, even the word Homer is a fiction, is a kind of our invention. It's art, it's, art. It's, it's, it's ascetic, right? Think about this in the sense of nominalism. Homer doesn't refer to a, anything that we can understand or see or archeologically under, know as what? True, right? Homer, Homer doesn't, ho, the, the word Homer doesn't correspond with anything, anything true or anything that we can objectively know because we objectively know nothing. So even the word Homer, right, is, is an arbitrary, it's got in some weird way, it's gotta be arbitrary. And, 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 and the word serves as a kind of reference or a kind of, a kind of representation of something that we want to be an author, right? Right, the word Homer does not correspond in any way to a real person that we know of. The time period, 760 to, to, to 650, as, 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 as a kind of weird way of dating time space, doesn't, doesn't correspond to anything true that we know. There, it's, it's a kind of this nominalist, it's just kind of this game we're playing. Now, to be sure, it's an important game, right? But, but we know nothing, which means, which means, and drive this home again, right? At the very center of the Greek world, and therefore, therefore, Western civilization, there's no author. We've invented one for our purposes. Homer who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey during this time. But we know damn well, because we don't know anything, that that's a fiction. So at the very center, there's no author. You've got these two poems, which are real. The Iliad and the Odyssey are real poems. Someone really wrote them and they got rewritten over time, right? So those are real, but we don't know anything about the origin, the authorship. There's no, we don't know anything about the author. And therefore, in postmodern language, it's decentered. The author is decentered. Right? There, there, there's, no, there's no center. Uh, Homer is not a, a real person that we know. He's decentered. And, and we can't know anything about the, the origin, right? I mean, the debate about the Homeric period, some, some people dated as early as 1200 BC. Herodotus, the, Greek, the first Greek historian, Writing, writing in the 480s BC, thought the Homeric period was 800 BC. Contemporary scholars located, for whatever reason, between 750 and 650. So, so there's a 600 year span between 1200 BC and 600 BC, 600 years. Of, of, of what can possibly count as the Homeric period, as the or then therefore as the origin of the Greek world, and by extension, the origin of Western civilization. And, and so in the same way that there's no author, it's decentered, there's also no origin to Western civilization. We, we don't know the origin. The origin is a mystery. It's an abyss. It's a kind of nothingness. It's, well, it's sometime, we think, between 1200 B, 12, 
100 BC and 650 BC. It's a lot of time, right? Right? And so there's so there's no origin, and 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 I bore you to tears with this, and I want to drive this home as an important idea because one of the core elements that is associated with all metaphysical systems of thought, some of the core and essential elements that are associated with all forms of metaphysical thought, whether it's philosophy, whether it's theology, or whether it's some form of, of normative, social, behavioral, medical, and physical sciences in the Enlightenment. What is essential to all three of those is some idea, is some claim, is some assertion, one, that there is an author, right? Because, because all metaphysical theories assume that there's an objectively true what? Self, right? All metaphysical theory, systems of thought, Platonic philosophy, does, Plato, does Plato think there's an objectively true self? Damn straight. It's, 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 your, it's your unique talents and abilities nature writes into your soul. It's right in the Republic. If you, if, right, it's right in the Republic. Does Christianity think there's an objectively true self? Absolutely. In fact, God made each person unique. Right? I, I, am, I am an objectively true self because I am created by God. And I'm made in God's image. Right? There's an, if, if, if you are committed to some form of metaphysical theology, you are absolutely committed to the idea that there's an objectively true self. Same with science. Science, in, in a different way, of course, says, yeah, there's an objectively true self. There's an objectively true set of DNA and bio neural processes that make up Nick Dungy, make up his intelligence, make up his gender, make up with, you know, the health of his body, the sickness of his body, whether he's deviant or mentally healthy, right? There's a, there's a kind of set of markers, of course. And what's critical to postmodernism is the suspicion that there's an objectively true what? Self. And, 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 and this kind of plays with this idea, this awareness that even at the origin, non-origin of Western, of the Greek world, there's no author, there's, there, there's no objectively true author. So, so for postmodernism, they're, they're very suspicious about the existence of an objectively true self. So postmoderns like to talk about Whatever subjectivity is, whatever identity is, whatever subjectivity is, the post that Nietzsche loves, the, Nietzsche didn't use this word, but he might as well have, but Foucault loves this, Derrida and Judith Butler, right? They love this idea. In fact, it's critical to all nominalist and postmodern approaches that the self is decentered, that there is no objectively true self, that what the self is, what subjectivity is, what the self is, what identity is, is itself a kind of effect of power. It's constructed. Constructed in what? Language. Right? So the self is real. Nick Dungy is real, but there's nothing objectively true about it. And again, more on that. We, we unpack this slowly as we go along. All right. So, so postmoderns are obsessed with decentered subjectivity. And then two, Postmoderns are kind of, there, there is no pure origin, right? Just, just like as Nietzsche reads, as Nietzsche looks at the Homeric moment and the way the Homeric moment becomes, I don't know, is it, was it 1200 BC? Is it 650 BC? What, what, what's the origin? What's the true origin? Everybody, you know, what's the origin? Well, from a certain point of view, which is actually accurate if we don't lie to ourselves and say we know things we don't. But from Nietzsche's point of view, there is no origin to Western, to the Greek world. We don't know. It's, it's a kind of mystery. It's kind of a nothingness. It's kind of an abyss. There's no origin. In fact, what, what became the Greek world was opened, disclosed, created, invented as a kind of human invention and an assertion of power. And it was kind of imposed, it just, there it is. 
Let's, let's open up and create the space of meaning and definition and values and purposes. We're going to call it the Greek world. Right? So, so there's no pure origin. Now, this is really profoundly important in the brander scheme of this, which has now become this exhausting class. Give you guys your money back for God's sake. Right? But this is really profound because in the same way that all metaphysical theories of thought assert as an essential condition and element of their system of thought that there's an objectively true self, Plato said, you have an objectively true set of talents and capacities that nature writes in your soul. That's what Plato says. The Christians say that you, you are made in the image of God and you are unique. You have a unique soul. Nick Dungy is unique and Nick Dungy's soul is unique from Jacob's or from Brian's or from Ruth's or from Leslie's or from Linda's or Varick's, right? And, that, and that's the true. And the same with science. In the same way that every metaphysical system of thought makes that assertion, metaphysics is also obsessed with origin, right? The, the, the truth has a kind of origin, right? Plato, Plato thinks the cosmos is, is literally geometric and, and, and mathematical, and it's objectively true in that sense. Literally, New Testament Christianity tells, well, not New Testament Christianity, but Old Testament Christianity tells the origin, right, of the cosmos. The, there's God. Who knows why? Just there, God's there. And then what did God do? God made what? God made the universe. Right? And then God made the world. And then God made people. Right? There's an origin. There's an origin. Here it is. And even in science. Science is obsessed with its own origin. Right? What do they call it? Call it the Big Bang. Everything that is created was created out of nothing. <laughs> Sounds very postmodern in a weird, funny way. Big Bang. <laughs> Big Bang. Origin. Objectively true. Origin. So metaphysics is obsessed, platonic metaphysics, New Testament Christian theology, and enlightenment normative social behavioral medical sciences. They're all obsessed with two things. There's an objectively true self. And we can, we can, we can figure out something about the origins. And ever since Plato and New Testament Christianity and enlightenment, those have been essential elements to about how we conceive who the hell we are as human beings and how we conceive the origin of all of this shit. And Nietzsche and Foucault and postmodernism in general is, is suspicious of, the, of all of those. But first of all, because they're suspicious of the existence of an objective truth. They're very suspicious of it. So they're, they're suspicious about the existence of an objectively true self. They think the self is something different. Okay, we'll find out what that is. And they're extremely suspicious about these, these stories that pretend to tell you the real true origin. Now, this origin stuff is also really important in a, in a really profound way at every level of existence, theoretical, political, contemporary, right? Because, because if you think that there is an objectively true origin and that there are objectively true things about people, races or ethnicities, and even objectively true things about individuals, then you're, you're committed to these stories about pure origins. You're committed to these stories about that there's something really true about race. You're committed to these stories that there's something objectively true about gender and sexuality and how people make love or who they marry or, or differences between the races or differences between the ethnicities. All of that stuff is in one way or another a byproduct of some form of metaphysics.
And this is important because the consequences are important. So Nietzsche says, hey, generally speaking, as the heirs of the enlightenment, the last iteration of this weird metaphysical poem that's being written and rewritten and restylized, right? We, we are still committed to this idea that this is an objectively true self and that there are these objectively true origins. And all of this is in some way true. And Nietzsche wants to say, and by the way, we say all of that begins with Plato. It, it's important and that's why Socrates and Plato are important and monumental and, and, and now we're just refining it. And Nietzsche wants to say, look, let's just, let's just kind of take a step back, all right? Let's, 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 let's start with the Homeric traditions, what do we know? Well, well what, we, what we call the Homeric traditions emerge out of these two epic poems. And why do we call them the Homeric traditions? Because well, we think Homer wrote them. Oh. Well, what do they do? They open the Greek world and the Greek world becomes the, 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 the source material for Greek tragedy and Greek tragedy becomes a source material for Socrates and Plato and then metaphysical philosophy and that becomes a source material for the New Testament Christianity and that becomes the new the source material for what becomes science and then later the enlightenment and, and now this. And Nietzsche says, well, okay, what do we know about that? Oh, we know nothing. It's, it's kind of an invention, kind of a fiction. It's, it's kind of a, it's a useful invention we're telling ourselves and we can have a conversation about who the fuck we are and where we come from but it's a fiction, right? We know nothing. Oh, so there's no author. There's no author of the two epic poems that created, that invented the Greek world. Huh. So it's decentered. There's decentered authorship. Who invented, who wrote, who discovered, who created the Greek world? Nah. We think some person named Homer, but we don't know it's decentered. Could have been all these different things. Maybe it was three people. Maybe it was a couple of people. Maybe it was just one person. We don't fucking know. It's decentered. You can't. You know there are these possibilities, but there's no there's no center. There's no core. There's no truth. No groundedness. It's decentered. Okay. And same with the origin. What's the origin of Western civilization? Don't fucking know. Can't know. All right. Now that's that's critical, right? We we it's not just that we're talking about the Homeric traditions and the Iliad and the Odyssey in in what limited sense we are in a material and academic way, in Enlightenment science sort of way, but more importantly, we're talking about it for what we don't know about it, what we can't know about it, and how what we can't know about it reveals what's important to postmodernism. And what's important to postmodernism, one, is that they're very suspicious about the idea that there's an objectively true you. You should be very suspicious about the idea that there's an objectively true you. And then two, equally as important, you should be really suspicious about a story that tells you about your pure origin, your true origin. You should be suspicious about those stories, especially those stories that want you to, to believe that there, 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 there's a pure blood. There's, 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 there's true race. There's true ethnicity. There's true blood. I mean, for God's sake, even Harry Potter, even Harry Evan Potter, for God's sake, right? What was, what was, a, what was a big theme Okay, we can bring pop culture. See, now, see, now I'm worthy of the fan camp because we can talk pop culture and Nietzsche, all right? All right, but even in Harry Potter, everybody saw Harry Potter, made billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of fucking dollars. J.K. Rawlings is not driving a red Mazda 3 like Professor Dungey. She did something that made fucking money. <laughs> everybody saw the damn movie. And the movies were about lots of things like all movies are. 
All right, but one of the important sub-themes in the movies was all the drama about mud butts. Oh, are you a pure wizard? Or are you a half human, half wizard? Right? Was that, was that, I don't even know. I didn't see the movies, but did they call them mudbloods? Is that what they called them? Right? Yeah. Isn't, is, wasn't, wasn't her, her mind can, and her mind me? I can never, never pronounce the name. But, but the woman witch, the girl witch in, in Harry Potter, the, did they even call them witches? Are they, what are they, wizards? They're okay. witches. They're witches. Okay. I don't fucking know. But I do know that the young girl was a mudblood. Was a mudblood. Okay. Fuck, mud in the blood, filth in the blood, mud in the blood, dirt in the blood, pollution in the blood, contamination in the blood, inferiority in the blood, marginalization in the blood. To have the idea of mud blood, pollution in the blood, sickness in the blood, inferiority in the blood. And therefore, the person who has mud blood as a legitimate target of marginalization, of hate, of violence, of death, of discrimination. You can't have the idea of mud blood if you don't already have the idea of pure blood. What are pure blood wizards? So even in Harry Potter, fucking Harry Potter, the wizarding world of Harry Potter, you've got a fucking Universal Studios and you can ride the ride. Even there in the most pop of all pop culture stuff is the idea of mudblood. And the great philosophic, if there is a great philosophical moment in Harry Potter, sir, Potter, sir, Potter, can't say the word. It is the idea that they're fighting that discrimination, that they're fighting that marginalization, that they're fighting that oppression. They're fighting the violence that's going to be imposed upon the mud blood. Well, why does the mud blood exist? Because people believe that there's an objectively true thing and there's an objectively true origin and that there's objectively true blood and objectively true race and objectively true how we fuck and how we have sex and who we marry and how we marry, all of that. Can't have mud blood if you don't have a kind of metaphysics. All right. So, so Nietzsche wants us to revisit the origin of the Greek world and the, therefore the origin of Western civilization. One, just so we can be honest about it. And so we can, we can start to open up things that are critical to postmodernism in general. There's no author. We don't know who the hell Homer is and there's no true self. We say, we say, well, I'm the author. I'm the author of my thoughts. I'm the author of my, of my actions. We, use, we say that all the time. I, I, Nick, Nick Dungy is the author of his thoughts. It's the author of his actions. I even author my books. I made you buy them because they're so bad. I had to force people to buy them. The shitty author I am. All right? We talk like that. And when we talk about, I'm the author of my thoughts, I'm the author of my actions, I'm the author of my books, I'm the author of my songs, right? My intellectual property. All of you are going to go to law school next year, and the first damn, the first course you're going to take in, in 1L is property. And the first semester, it's real property, land, buildings. And the second semester, it's intellectual property, right? I'm the author. And, and, and when we say that, we assume that there's an objectively true what? So, such that you and I can be authors. And then we run around saying, yeah, there's an origin. It's an origin. This is, this is our land. This is, this is, this is the origin of our, the color of our skin and our ethnicity. An origin, and and and, there, and by the way, there's two things about about those things, and we can put people on hierarchies, and we can use this story to marginalize some people. 
and Nietzsche and Foucault are going to say. Let's, let's look at this whole story differently. Okay, there's no author. We don't know anything. It's decentered, and there's no origin. In fact, there can't, we can't know anything about an origin because what we do know about the origin are these two poems, and we don't even know when they began, and we don't know who wrote them. Okay. So, the Greek world was a human invention. It's an assertion of power. Now, to be sure, extremely, despite the fact that the Greek world and then what became of Greek tragedy and then what became of Western civilization, to be sure, it, to say that it was a human invention in no way for Nietzsche and Foucault's point of view is to, to, to denigrate it. Thank God, thank God someone invented it or some group of people, otherwise there would be what? Nothing, <laughs> there would be no Greek world. So thank God, in, no pun intended, <laughs> Right? Thank God it was done. It's, a, it's, a, it's, one, and it's one of the most important and existentially powerful and profound things human beings can do to give their life and the world meaning, value, and purpose. So we can do heroic, erotic, beautiful things. But for all of that, it's still a human invention. It's still decentered. And whatever meaning and value and purpose is invented is kind of thrown. It's asserted. It's thrown into a world that in and of itself doesn't have objective meaning, value, and purpose over people who, who okay, they, they, they come to to take up those meanings and those values and the purposes, but, but it's not objectively true about them. It's not corresponding to something objectively true about their natures or their souls or their, or their sort of bioneural and, 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 and DNA arrangements. Okay, all right. So let's look, let's look at our own history and look at ourselves as decentered and without pure origins. Okay. And let's not only look at them as decentered, as assertions of power and without pure origins, but also look at them as things that are constantly in what? Constantly in what? Change, transformation. They're contingent, the words and the meanings and the values and the purposes, precisely because they're human invention, precisely because there's assertions of power, precisely because they do not correspond to anything objectively real or true in that deeper sense. They are contingent. They're unstable. They're contingent. They're undergoing constant transformation and change. One, because they're thrown into a world that resists it, like you and I are living right now. COVID showed up and it shattered your world, shattered medical science. It shattered the hospital system. It shattered your senior year of college. It's gonna shatter what jobs are there for you when you get out of college. Shattered it all. Turns out that the world and COVID didn't give a shit about your economy, didn't give a shit about your health, didn't give a shit about your value, didn't give a shit about your senior year, didn't give a shit about what you're gonna do next year. It just shattered it. Why did it shatter it? Because your meaning and your value and our medical science and our capitalist economy and our fragile democracy, all of this is kind of as, as important and as central and profound and erotic as it is, is just this kind of invention of hovering and moving through time and space in a world that is one, doesn't have meaning, value, and purpose, and in some ways might even be resistant to it. In fact, the tragedy of this tragedy class, what you should take away, is precisely how fragile your subjectivity is. All your dreams, your senior year is gone. Your dreams may be gone. People you love may be gone. It's all fragile. Okay, Are you, can, can you bear it? And two, not only, not only was what you thought was the most important about you and your meaning and your value and what you were going to do, not only has that been shattered, but the whole damn system, medical science. 
the whole response to COVID has been medieval. There is almost zero difference, almost zero difference between the response to the third wave of plague in 1495, the last serious outbreak of plague in Europe in 1495. There's almost no difference between the response to the outbreak of plague, say in Florence, Machiavelli's Florence in 1495, in fucking Los Angeles, 2020. Almost the same. Nothing we can do about it. Wash your hands, stay indoors. In fact, in fact, it's so it's so brutally similar that that the rich people seem to do better because they can they can get out of the city. They can go to their country homes or they can maybe get the best doctors. The era, just like in the plague in 1495, if, 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 you were, if you were one of the Medici aristocrats, you had a fucking better chance because you could get out of Florence, you could go to the country, you could, where hopefully there are fewer rats and fewer sick people and fewer infected water, you could go out to the country and kind of survive it. Maybe that, that was your best chance. And maybe you had money, so you got access to whatever herbal medicine there was or better food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, just like, just like it is now. If you're wealthy living in LA, or wealthy living in New York City, or, you're, or you just happen to be the president of the United States, you got access. You can leave New York City, you can go to the country home. You can leave LA, you can, you can go, you can go up to your country home, the San Andreas Valley. Maybe you get access to doctors. If you're poor, you're fucked. Don't come to the hospital until you're dying. Then it's too late. Yeah, not much has changed. For all of our medical technology, all of our science, all of our hubris, all of our power, our truth, nothing has changed. It's funny. All right. So that's why we look at this. Right? That's why Nietzsche wants us to look at this. At the very origin of the Greek world and Western civilization, there's no author. It's decentered. We don't know who the fuck Homer is. And there's no origin. And that playful thematic, that, that reinterpretation of telling the story has really important parallels to what kind of postmodernism is saying about individuals and political history. Nietzsche and Foucault and Judith Butler and Derrida and Leotard and Rorty, they're all really suspicious about the claim that there's an objectively true self. In fact, they don't think there is. In fact, they think you're better off if you adopt the idea that there's no objectively true self. And two, they're really suspicious about this idea that history, our, our moral history, our scientific history, our philosophical history, our religious history, our political history, they're really suspicious of the idea that those things have a pure, real origin. They don't. They're inventions and they're assertions of power. And if we can, if we can begin the possibility of taking up that perspective, if we can say, okay, what have been the consequences to my mind, my body and my politics that has resulted from my belief that there's an objectively true Nick Dungy informed by Platonic philosophy, New Testament Christianity, or Enlightenment bioneural and DNA science. What have been the consequences of my, my belief in and commitment to some form of objective truth? And what have been the consequences to my mind, body, and my politics? to believe that there's some historical, political, and economic, and racial, and ethnic origin that's true and that, that has meaning and value in these hierarchies. Huh. It's 
And the, what's, what's been the consequence of our belief in and commitment to some form of metaphysics. And so what Nietzsche wants us to do as we start to think about how he tells it, he's going to tell us the story. He's going to write, he's going to write the birth of tragedy. He writes it when he's 26 years old. Think about that. He's a few years older than most of you right now. Most of you are college seniors. You're 22, 23. Linda and I, I mean, Samantha, God, you know, right? We've been around a little longer, but, but all of you are in your early 20s. Nietzsche wrote this damn book. He's only, he's only a couple years older than you. He already has his PhD. <laughs> right? And he's going to write this book, and this book is going to tell an entirely different story than the Enlightenment story of its own history. It can shatter that history. And in fact, the book is so heavy, it shatters a history that, that the book cost Nietzsche his academic job. It cost him his job. Nietzsche loses everything. He loses his, his, his position at the university. He loses his prestige. He loses whatever value he had. And by the way, he had a lot. He was hanging in the Acer. He was, he was rolling with Wagner. He was rolling with Wagner. He was A-listing. Nietzsche was. He was at Beirut with the Wagners. Rolling with the Clooney's and the DiCaprio's and the Oprah's. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche was as well known and respected and as, as a celebrity as a culture could create. And the book cost him everything. The book wiped it out. He lost everything. <laughs> right? Fascinating. And by the way, in the meta tragedy of the whole class, the book, the book is what made Nietzsche become the Nietzsche we know and love. All right, so, so we're looking at this story, okay, the origin of, of the Greek world, these, these two poems, okay. How, how, how does what we know about those two poems become Greek tragedy several hundred years later, right? If, even if we want to assume for the purposes of the class that the Greek world, that the Homeric world was 750 to 650, the time period we're talking about is 450 BC to the, you know, basically the death of Socrates. And then, of course, we'll talk later about, about Foucault, but, but right, that's at least 200 years difference. What, what happens? How does, how does Greek tragedy become Greek tragedy? Right? And so, so a couple of things I want to say about this as we start to play with this now more. So, on Roman numeral two of the outline, the tertiary title is the Homeric Myths and Greek Tragedy. All right, so kind of using what we've already, so, so thinking about what we're thinking about it from a Nietzschean point of view, now let's, let's, let's have some fun here and also do serious things. All right, so, so from Nietzsche's point of view, the, whole, the Iliad and the Odyssey are human inventions. They invent the word, meaning, values, and purposes of what we come to call the Greek world. And because they invent those meanings, definitions, values, and purposes of what becomes the Greek world, right? Because prior to that, all those things didn't exist in a, in a more concrete way. That was also an assertion of power, right? Of course, right? Because now uh, Nick Dungey is saying, hey, this is what it means to be a, a, a Greek male. This is what it means to be heroic. Achilles, you weren't heroic. This is what it means to have courage. This is what it means to be a coward. This is what it means to be a woman. This is what it means to be a man. This is who has power and why, right? It invented all that shit. Or at least it made it more stable than it previously was. And that's power. It's imposing. A kind of mean, it's inventing and imposing a meaning and a definition and a value and purpose on things that just are real, but objectively don't possess those things. Okay, all right. And it emerges out of this non-origin. We can't, we can't get behind it, right? The Illid and the Odyssey create the Greek world. The Greek world's a poem, it's an invention, it's an assertion of power. 
And once the Greek world is invented, then Greek tragedy is invented. And, 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 and once Greek tragedy is invented, guess who shows up to try to destroy Greek tragedy? Socrates. And they do it through metaphysics. Oh, and that goes on for a couple hundred years. And then these weird people called the, not weird, but you know, these people called the Christians show up and say, oh no, 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 those, those Greek and Roman philosophers, those pagans, oh my God, fuck man. Right? And there's God. And Jesus is walking around talking about God. Okay. And that happens for 1500 years, right? And then modernity comes and people, and, and Galileo sitting there, and, right? And, and, and Da Vinci and Kepler, Kepler's sitting there, and Galileo sitting there. And they go, oh man, Aris the Christian co option of Aristotle's spheres just doesn't, it doesn't seem right. The whole Christian physics and the whole Christian astronomy and it doesn't seem right. And then science comes. Right? Well, all of those things from a Nietzschean point of view are poems, are, they're poems inside a poem. They're a poem of a poem of a poem of a poem. And once the original poem begins in, in this kind of fascinating, playful way, there's no getting outside the poem. Right? We'll play with that more. Don't worry about that. We'll play with that more. All right. And what we know, in addition, is that the poem is, 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 is has the poem ever since the Greek world, and then how the Greek, how the, home, how the Homeric moment created the Greek world, and then how that became the tragic Greeks, and then how metaphysical philosophy emerged, right? And then how New Testament Christianity emerged, and then how science, and one thing we know about the poem is the poem has been doing what? It's been changing. Now we tend to say to ourselves, well, it's getting more true because we're learning more, right? But if you step back and look at it from a Nietzschean point of view, it's changing because it's, it's, it's unstable, right? It's conflicted, it's contested. People argue about what the poem should mean. Just like you're doing now in your life. If you're out there protesting, right? If, if, if you're protesting Black Lives Matter, if you're protesting against police brutality, and racial injustice and economic injustice. If, if you're protesting to keep the ethnic studies requirement at the CSU system, you're engaged in this battle over what the fuck things mean and who gets to decide. So you're in the poem. You're participating in conflict and contestation in the poem over what the poem should mean and who gets to decide. Nietzsche just wants you to become aware of it and understand its origins and how it operates so you can get better at it. That's what he means by coming heroic. All right. So, a couple things, and we're going to finish this. A couple things to know about the movement from the Homeric tradition, from the Homeric moment, to, to really what Nietzsche is obsessed with, and that is the Greeks of the tragic age. The, the Greeks that lived from about 490, so just say 500 BC, all the way, 490, all the way, to through the Peloponnesian War to the death of Socrates, right? 100 years. The Greeks that lived during this 100 years, the Greeks of the tragic age, right? What does Nietzsche want you to take away from that? So first, the Homeric myths and the individual moral and political values they give rise to become the loose source material for what we call Greek tragedy, right? Greek tragedy is a kind of stylization. It's a, it's a reinterpretation. It's a recreation. It's a redefinition. It's a stylization of the Homeric traditions, right? And this is really important. And by the way, this is why Nietzsche is going to say, what you need is style and not knowledge. What you need is style and not knowledge. And ask, and someone remind me to talk about that in another lecture. Write that down in your notes and say, hey, what the hell did you mean by that? I know we've already talked about it. It's in your notes, but I want to keep returning to it because it's very powerful. It's very insightful. 
But so for Nietzsche, Greek tragedy is a stylization of the Homeric tradition, right? Which makes sense. He, he interprets Aeschylus and he interprets Socrates, the two great Greek tragic writers that we have. That, and they're the only two because we're the only two surviving things. I mean, that's all we have. And we're probably some really brilliant fucking people, but we, 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 they're lost to history, right? They, don't, they literally don't exist anymore, right? You're not going to find them archaeologically. You're not going to find them in some dig. They're fucking gone, which is beautiful. That's beautiful. Right? Meaning disappears. If it's not somehow preserved and restylized, it disappears. You disappear. I disappear. We die. We're mortal. No amount of language, no amount of medicine, no amount of technology, no amount of power, no amount of metaphysics is going to allow you to escape your own fucking death. You and I are going to die. And the meaning that we invent and the, and the definitions we give it and the values we assert and the purposes we arrange it into, all dies. Our paradigm is dying right now. Your senior year died. Capitalism is dying. Liberal democracy is dying. For better or for worse. Okay. So the Homeric myths serve as the foundation, the source of the poem that gets restylized gets re recreated, reinvented, repurposed. It's, it gets sampled, right? Right? It gets sampled. <laughs> right? Greek tragedy is a kind of sampling. It samples the Homeric tradition. It's even like more pop culture. Come on, man. Sample. All right. Now, from, soccer, from, from Nietzsche's point of view, Aeschylus and Sophocles, I asked you to read Sophocles' great tragedy Antigone. Aeschylus and Sophocles are reworking slash stylizing the themes of the Homeric traditions in their own particular subjective and idiosyncratic ways. You, you can think of Greek tragedy as a kind of rewriting of the poem of the Iliad and the Odyssey, but stylizing it, rewriting it for, for their own reasons and for their own meanings and to create different spins on the value to bend the purposes in different ways, to arc the purposes in different ways, right? So, so think of Sophocles in this Nietzschean sense as reworking or stylizing the Homeric traditions and doing so in his own subjective, particular, idiosyncratic ways. He's kind of reinventing them. And, and by re he's rewriting the poem. And by reinventing and rewriting the poem, he's also asserting a kind of what? Power, right? He's kind of asserting the power. Hey, this is, this is what we want the Greeks to think about. This is what it now means to be Greek, right? Now, now you can be Antigone. You can say to Creon, fuck you. Now you're gonna die for it to be sure. But you die heroically, not like your sister is Mene, who said, oh, fuck, we're just women. Not much we can do. What, what, am, I, what am I supposed to say? We're women. We're not designed to contend with men. Huh. Sophocles invented Antigone is the first modern feminist fucking superhero. And the Antigone that you are seeing that becomes the icon of, of the first feminist voice is an invention of Sophocles. It's a stylization of Sophocles. Okay, it's profound, it's power. Sophocles just opened up a little bit of different space for what women can be. Read the tragedy, you got, you got, you got, two, you got, you got two takes on what a woman can be, you got Antigone. He says, yeah, I got, I, I, I've got a responsibility. I got a right. She didn't use that word. I wasn't confused with natural right theory. But, but I, I've got a responsibility. I got, I got the power to interpret what the gods expect. And I got to bury my brother. And no fucking dude, no king is going to tell me not to. Right? Conflict over what things are going to mean. And that's the first feminine voice. And, and you got this beautiful juxtaposition, right, between this, emer this, this emergent 
creative, powerful, new meaning and value and purpose of the feminine voice, saying no to patriarchy, saying no to the king. And the sister, the, the sister embodies perfectly this kind of Homeric expectation of the daughter and the sister of a royal family. There's many. Okay. Sophocles stylizes, he reinvents the, 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 the poem. He rewrites the poem and in rewriting the poem makes a new poem and asserts power. This is, this is now what's possible for women. This is what now what's possible to do this grander idea of giving one's life meaning and giving it value. And, and, and if you have to, dying in the fucking process. And by the way, don't tell me you don't understand that. Because if you're out, again, forgive me for going back to this, but if you're out in the streets protesting, you know it's dangerous. The police will fucking shoot you. Right wing fucking supremacists will come and they'll fucking shoot you. People are dying right now, attempting to rewrite our poem. And it's costing them their lives. So don't tell me you don't understand this. Don't tell me it's not relevant. You're fucking living it. All those people in Belarus, all the people in the orange in, in the Ukraine, all those students that got massacred in Tiananmen Square. This is everywhere. And this is what it's about. So from Nietzsche's point of view, Aeschylus and Sophocles are directly engaged in a sort of artistic an agonistic reinterpretation of the meaning, value, and purposes of their own lives and their own culture. They took their Homeric traditions, they took the poem they found themselves born into, and what they do? They rewrote it. They stylized it. They sampled what they wanted, and they, they worked it in, and they, and, and, and they opened up new possibilities, new voices, new struggles, and they opened up new space for human possibility. And they did it as a kind of an assertion of power, which is a good thing in a weird way. And they understood that it's conflict, it's agonistic. And it's agonistic, one, because whatever meaning you're, you and I are born into, it's not grounded anymore. It's not, it's not metaphysically true, it's not objectively necessary. There's no objective necessity for fucking liberal democracy to continue the way it is. In fact, it's dying, it's ending precisely because because there's no objective or metaphysical necessity for it to kind of continue, somehow the truth will prevail. <laughs> but they did it. And it's agonistic, it's fragile, it's contested, one, because it, it's a rewriting of the poem, and because it turns out that people contest the meaning and the definitions and the values and the purposes of the poem, of, of who they are and how, how they relate to other people in the economic and the social and the moral and the political context. All right, love you guys unconditionally. I'm gonna say a few more words about this on Thursday and we're doing a read through of the attempt at self-criticism, we move on. Love you guys very much, have a great day. See you Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Nick. Yep.